Let's do this. The Cult of Hockey podcast by the faithful and for the faithful. I'm Bruce, Bruce McCurdy, of the Edmonton Journal's Cult of Hockey. And I'm here tonight with my colleague, Kurt Levins, all the way from Pender Island in British Columbia. Uh, welcome, Kurt. Hi, my friend. How are you doing tonight? Pretty darn well. The orders beat the wild. The yeah. orders beat the wild. That never <laughs> happened. <laughs> not, not often enough. So... I, I lost I'm count of how many games over the years my family marched oh. down to first Rexall place and, and, and then Rogers place only to lose to those buggers. So it was good to see us pull one out tonight and a pretty complete performance, I thought, as well. I remember meeting Willie Mitchell's grandfather at the, at the uh, ah. first wild game I ever went to. I think it was 2000. Mm-hmm. And uh, there was this guy wearing a fully crested Mitchell number two with white hair and <laughs> sitting right in front of us. So I took sort of figured probably family. So I, you must know Willie. And he probably said, "Yep, he's my grandson. I'm here to see him." Oh, isn't and that great? It was, it was <laughs> awesome. I think Willie was from Powell River or something away out there on the Sunshine mm-hmm. Coast there in BC. And I think Grandpa's kind of followed the wild around Western Canada on the. On the first trip, but I can't remember all the details. I just remember having a really splendid conversation and, frankly, becoming a fan of Willie Mitchell uh, on that occasion, who did have a fine career mm-hmm. uh, for you know quite a long time as a solid defensive defenseman in the NHL. Well, I so, remember seeing my my cousin Jim play his first NHL hockey mm-hmm. game, and it was in Winnipeg. Oh and yeah. So, so we drove from where our farm in Saskatchewan out to Winnipeg. And that was the old Winnipeg Arena with the big, beautiful picture of the Queen in, in the one end. Right, and, right. Uh, and for uh, probably like you, like a little kid growing up on the prairie, to go to my first NHL hockey game and walk into that rink, boy, I I, I practically backed out of the arena that night because I just didn't want to leave. It's like what a what a wow. lifetime experience that I'll never forget. So, so this was your first NHL game and your cousin's? Yes. Yeah, it wow. was his, his first game in Winnipeg. And oh, okay. Dad, Dad loaded us into the van and out we went. It was mm-hmm. Detroit and Winnipeg. Jim was playing right. for Detroit. Right, right. And so, uh, yeah, I'll, I'll never, never forget that. He probably won't either more so him than me. <laughs> right on. Well, I have to say my warm feelings uh, extended towards Willie Mitchell did not extend to the wild for any length of time <laughs> thereafter. After, about after their 03 playoff run, I got a little tired of the club and the regular regular mundane beatings they used to give the Oilers in games that weren't even interesting. Now when they beat us, usually the games are at least interesting, and they have a couple of pretty fabulous players on their team. And uh, yeah. Kirill Kaprizov and Matt Zuccarello, to name a couple, that just have the puck on a string out there. And uh, they gave Oilers a pretty strong test tonight. Uh, and even as uh, uh, they won seven games in a row over Edmonton by a combined average score of five to two. Well, that was the that was the revenge score by Edmonton tonight, five to two, uh, where Oilers scored the first two and the last three goals of the game, and Minnesota had had their way with it for a fairly lengthy chunk of time in between. Anyways, uh, we're going to uh, uh, fall back to our usual uh, procedure here at the Cult of uh, two bad, two good things, two bad things. And two numbers, and because it's a, a big win over a over a, uh, uh, I guess we'll say respected opponent. We're going to go with two good things each. <laughs> so uh, you you have uh, first say, Kurt. What's your good thing number one? Well, you know what? I'll I'll start off with Stuart Skinner because I think if we were 28 games into the season, uh, and I would say to you. So, so Bruce, 28 games into the season, Stuart Skinner has played 16 of them. I think you would have gone, uh Mm -hmm. (laughs) uh-oh. I think you would have thought, wait a minute, why is our backup playing that much? Well, we don't need to go over why. We all know that. Mm -hmm. Um, But he continues to do what he does. 42 saves tonight. uh, And while some of that is shot volume. I'm not sure that 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 shot count is entirely indicative of the flow of play. Um, I'm thinking of that early power play that Minnesota had. And to me, uh, the game turned on that power play. Mm -hmm. Um, uh, And Stuart Skinner was certainly their best penalty killer on that sequence, even though I thought the PK, you know, units had a decent goal of it tonight. He was their best penalty killer by far. 
ended up the night with with uh, with 42 saves. Uh, here he sits, 16 games played into this 28 game season. He's nine and six, 281 goals against average, and a 919 save percentage. Mm-hmm. Uh, and he played every game on this homestand. And, and frankly, I'll be surprised if he doesn't play the next game as well. Because when you've got a goaltender going this well, I think you stick with the hot hand. So long as he's not tuckered out, and I'm sure the goalie coach will chime in on, you know, um, load volumes and, and, and rest and all that kind of stuff. But I'd keep putting the hot hand out there. And certainly uh, he won the goaltender battle tonight. And when you consider that Mark Andre Fleury was at the other end, that's no small task. Yeah, facing off against a, a, a slam dunk future Hall of Famer, and uh, you know, not just winning the game, but but I agree, getting the better of the goalie battle, and I would say doing a better job of keeping his composure in the process. MAF uh, blew a gasket there at one point. It was kind of funny. <laughs> but, <laughs> he did. Yeah. <laughs> and he's a competitive son of a gun. But uh, uh, so is Stu Skinner. And, and uh, uh, he had, uh, geez, a couple of saves in particular. And I think that, that beginning of the second period power play, uh, that stop he made off of Kaprizov mm-hmm. on a, across the Royal Road and he slammed it into, he didn't just slam it into Skinner, like he didn't pull it back into the goalie. He picked the short side corner and Stu got all the way over and kicked that one up. Yeah. And then there was another fabulous save on a set play that they had behind the net where they made the pass behind uh, yeah. the net to Zuccarello and he tried to just stuff it in and the, and the, the I have to say, hats off to Sportsnet. They had the replay of how uh, Zuccarello had scored an identical play on a five-on-three that Minnesota had early in the season, and it mm-hmm. was good. And Skinner had to be over there, and he was so you know, just a matter of being big and having power off him and uh, responding and goals uh, and taking a high-level shot. So, uh, okay. Yeah, I was just losing oh, you for okay. a second, but I'm back now. Uh, I'll, 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 okay, close my, I'll close my comment and Skinner by saying, mm-hmm. you know, he's a big guy, uh, but what I like about him the most is how big he's playing. He looks mm-hmm. so confident. He's filling the net right now. I think we all have seen goaltenders. Big goaltenders can play small sometimes, uh, but Skinner seems to have such a confidence about him right now that he's using all of his frames so efficiently that I think some of his best saves don't look that great because he's right. just positioned for them so well. Another rocket that the priest put the hit him was up in the clavicle area. And you know, Minnesota it hurt spit holes in the net. We had last time we played these guys. And they when they slammed a few pucks past uh, uh, Jack Campbell. But um, Skinner was uh, Skinner was, uh, as you say, very big and gave him a very little. Yeah, so uh, good on him. So, yeah, first good thing, Nugent um, Hopkins, who had uh, a pretty darn good game tonight at, in, all, in all scenarios, really. A uh, five on five, uh, where the Oilers had all the shots in his uh, 15 minutes. He was uh, of, uh, going up against the Erickson Act line that was giving the McDavid crew much trouble. Uh, over the, with the last change, that was, um, uh, that was um, uh, Coach Woodcroft's choice tonight, and he put Nuge out right for the opening faceoff and, and lined him up. And they got the better of the shots, 10 to 6. They got a goal each. Uh, with uh, each each team did was out there and uh, on five, uh, but he also did uh, good work on various special teams, including uh, two power plays where he got primary assists, feeding the puck across the slot to the sniper and what I'm starting to call the G spot, the goal spot at the Oilers uh, uh, snipers, usually dry saddle, but on the first goal tonight, McDavid. Uh, just sort of in, in the right face-off circle, you know where they set up. So uh, they, uh, they do put 
crooked numbers under the G bomb when they shoot them. I did it twice tonight. Like David just slammed one, uh, one really crisp Nuge pass across the uh, slot, and and, and uh, Connor slammed it right under the crossbar. And then I thought this was a really big goal in the third period with the Oilers ahead three to two, and they finally got their second power play after Minnesota had a dozen or so. And uh, it was, uh, again, uh, it was uh, basically Minnesota was pressuring the puck all the way around, and it went from Barry uh, to uh, 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 through Hyman, what he took a guy with him, to McDavid, and he passed it out to Nuge, and he actually got it through two sticks and over to dry saddle and guess what there was nobody left covering dry saddle and he had nothing but gaping net to uh, deposit the puck into which he did uh, with uh, some vigor and that made it four two and it kind of opened up a i wasn't like entirely comfortable but four two was a was a nice situation to be in for sure when you know in the third period uh midway in the third as it was uh he also of course played on the penalty kill newton hopkins uh he played tonight uh, just just under three minutes on the penalty kill. And uh, the unit was successful in keeping the goals off the board, just the one that was essentially a five-on-three goal. Uh, the process wasn't entirely perfect, and I'll talk about that later. But uh, uh, And finally, on the five-on-six at the end of the game, yet another manpower situation, and Nuge pots the empty netter on a great shot mm-hmm. against the uh, uh, you want to talk about big goalies? Well, Jared Spurgeon isn't one, but he sure had sure had the angle cut down. He was like five feet away from Nuge, and he would have filled most of the net from where he was. And uh, Ryan just calmly picked his spot and buried it right in the top corner. And that was just icing on the cake. Of course, he could have just shot it in the corner and won 4-2. But what's a nice win without an empty net goal as a cherry on the top, you know? Yeah, so for was, sure. It's always nice to be on the right side of an empty net goal. A good way to end a end the night, especially when uh, you know you, the guys that are uh, racking up the points and uh, are, uh, are guys that you're rooting for, like uh, like Nugent Hopkins or Drysaddle and Hyman, who got the assists on that particular play. So nice way to finish the night. And I just thought Ryan was solid right across the board tonight, and uh, even on the faceoff dot, you know, 11 out of 20, 55 percent take that every night yep that's well above his career average right so yeah. Yeah. yeah he's he's been on a real run ever since uh uh jay woodcroft realigned his lines and put uh mcdavid and dry together in the first line mm-hmm. yeah yeah you had some interesting numbers on that kurt on just what nuge has done in those games yeah it's uh it's the 12 and 6 so it's been six wow. games since 29 and 97 that have been together and Nugent Hopkins has 12 points in those six wow. games. Many of them on the power play, of course, but still, he's, uh, you know, he's uh, two points a game is a nice role for pretty much any player at any time. Well, I think he's been our best two-way player all season long, and mm-hmm. I and I was thinking about this earlier tonight. You know, when, in particular, when Kane and then McLeod went down, if Nugent Hopkins wasn't on the top of his game, I think this could have gone rather badly yeah. um, because really he's had to fill two roles. He's, he's had to move back from, from, a, from a third center uh, position up, up and to fill that top six uh, role with Kane out. Um, and with McLeod out, um, mm-hmm. You know the ranks at the ranks at center were, were thinned out a little bit too. So it was doubly important that he brought his best game. We're used to seeing Ryan play a, a really solid two-way game, but I mean mm-hmm. he's on pace. It's 28 games in, so it's a little early maybe, but he's certainly on pace for a career year. He's just having a mm-hmm. terrific start to his season. Well, I noticed the other day, uh, and this will have changed, but only slightly, and I'm not sure who's ahead. But two days ago. He was exactly tied with none other than Austin Matthews in the scoring mm. race, the reigning MVP. They both had 27 games and the exact same 13, 17, 30 uh, lines. And, of course, Nuge has added three points to that. And I know Matthews had something last night, but it wouldn't surprise me now that Ryan has even pulled a little ahead. So people are always doing the McDavid-Matthews comparison, the Toronto people are, that 
And people out here are saying, well, how about dry saddle Matthews? Well, now we got Nuge and Matthews. So you got me all interested that's a, now. That, I've got to pull a, it up that's and look. A, that's a pleasant <laughs> surprise. So yeah, he, he and Matthews are tied. So yeah. Mm -hmm. Right yeah. on. Yeah. Well, so let's move on then, Kurt, to your uh, to your second thing. Yes, uh, my second thing was the bottom six. Mm -hmm. um, and if you had told me tonight um, that guys like Costin and Shore and Ryan and Hamblin played as little as they actually did, I would have been surprised. Because mm -hmm. when you look at their time on ice, Shore mm -hmm. 848, Costin 812, Holloway 723, Hamblin 906, Ryan 1143. Um, but I think if you weren't looking at those numbers, I think you would have thought that those guys played way more than they did because the bottom six really had an impact on this game. Mm -hmm. Um, now that was my eye saying that. So I thought, well, that's easy 11s. Let's see if there are some stats out there to kind of back up what you thought you saw. So I went to natural stat trick and I looked at, 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 uh, CF five on five. Mm -hmm. And here's the CF percentages five on five for our bottom six players tonight. Derek Ryan, 54%. Devin Shore, 54%. Dylan Holloway, 69%. Jesse Pogliarvi, 78%. Wow. Clean Costin, 55%. And I'm missing one, James Hamlin, 64%. Yeah. When you get that mm -hmm. out of your bottom six, yep. you're, you're giving yourself a very good chance to win that hockey game. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and and between them, all those guys, they you know they scored the first goal of the game, uh, Ryan from Shore and Costin, uh, which is third or fourth line. Take your pick. It's almost like two fourth lines the way they got to set up at the moment. Agreed. Uh, certainly with the ice time that they're getting, but that's fine. Uh, and they've got um, uh, and they so they won their part of the game one nothing. More or less sawed off on shot shares, a little more on Corsi, a little little less on shots, but pretty much even across the board. And then the other the other line of Hamblin between uh, uh, Holloway and Pugliarvi, uh no goals were scored on their watch, and no goals were in danger of being scored against the Oilers on their watch because they had the puck in the other team's end much of the night. You know, I mean. 11, 11, 4, 3 against for Paul Yarvey in his time. He had the least ice time in the Oilers at 7.38. So that's, uh, you know, uh, maybe there's a message in there, but really there's much of a muchness. All of them, with the exception of, of uh, Ryan, who added a fair bit of time on the shorthanded unit, they were all in single digits, high single digits for minutes. But I thought they all, you know, carried their weight, did their part, and helped the team win. Yeah, and you know James Hamblin, um, mm -hmm. I I was certainly guilty of underestimating this guy in training camp. So I'll mm -hmm. I'll wear that. Two little stats on him tonight: sixty-seven mm -hmm. percent on faceoffs. Yep. I think a lot of eyebrows were raised when he when he uh, started as the fourth line or third line center, whatever whichever mm -hmm. line it is, against uh, against Arizona. But he did it again tonight. Mm -hmm. uh, and acquitted himself quite well, played a minute seven uh, shorthanded, including a really terrific gutsy play along the wall to clear his own yeah. that seemed a little more like rugby than hockey. But I, I think the whole arena saw the effort and appreciated it and, and applauded it. So um, yeah. he's uh, he is contributing more than I initially thought that he would be able to, and good on him. Yeah, that was with the uh, – this wasn't just sort of any sort of penalty kill – middle of the second period this was the Oilers are ahead four to two uh but uh the wild get a power play with 10 minutes to go in the third period if they score there you know it's game on for sure and yet the Oilers have a face off in their own zone with 40 or 50 seconds to go on the penalty kill and who's out there but James Hamblin uh I don't know exactly the result of the face off maybe maybe even that was part of the reason that uh, coach put him out there was that he was their top face off man in this game mm -hmm. But uh, he uh, uh, he made a key play, like you say, to win the puck battle and not only win the puck, but get it out and down and basically kill off the waning seconds of the penalty. And, and the Oilers weren't quite home and cooled out at that moment. But once uh, I think it was Kulak stepped out of the box at the end of that penalty, I started feeling, you know, this is where we're in pretty good shape now. So. Yeah. 
So, anyways, uh, yeah, it's always nice when you get a win, and, and you're not just talking about McDavid and Drysaddle. When those, mm-hmm. those bottom six guys chip in like they did tonight, and we're yep. real difference makers, right? So, mm-hmm. yep. All right. Well, I'm going to pick for my uh, my second good thing, uh, Kyrie Yamamoto, uh, who has um, uh, just returned to the lineup in the last couple games after missing eleven. With, eleven. Uh, yes. With. Uh, we're not sure. Upper body injury officially, unofficially, either concussion or whiplash. Uh, I've heard both reports that he was having a little trouble with his uh, with his neck there for a while. Mm-hmm. And of course, you and I both know that he was never 100% during the early part of the season, but the Oilers literally had 12 forwards on their roster. And I think Kyler was toughing it out at less than 100% for much of that first going, and that explains his, to some extent, at least uh, his uh, his slow start, where you know he had no goals and I think three assists, you know, playing at the top six um, through uh, 14 games, and then when Kane went down, and whether he suffered an additional injury in that same game, what happened after Kane went down was that opened up the roster because Kane went on LTIR, and then they could bring up Costin, Yanmark. And so it kind of changed the depth position of the team. And they thought, well, let's use both Cost and Anya and Mark, and we can, you know, we can keep Yamamoto. He didn't go on injured reserve for a while, but at least there was the option to, you know, to to keep him out. Yeah. And, but they waited and they waited apparently long enough because since he's been back, he's just been the Energizer Bunny, just flying around all over the place out there, throwing himself into the, the, the fray as we're used to seeing and uh, tonight he finally got off the schneid, as the uh, sportscasters like to say, uh, with a kind of typical Yamamoto goal. You're not going to see him blowing away goalies with a 35-foot wrist shot. Uh, but what he did do was go to the slot and get a stick on Darnell Nurse's, uh, um, you know, finder shot from uh, long range. And managed to deflect it really nicely down onto the ice and then pop it up over the goalie. That's a real tough save for a goalie. That's, mm-hmm. a, that's a lacrosse type shot, you know, the bounce shot. And the goalie's reaction is to go down with the puck and then it's already flying up over his his shoulder. And that one uh, found the corner. Uh, he also drew two penalties in this game. He took a penalty, but he, you know, he was right in there. And I think the penalties he drew... Uh, were the ones, uh, one of them at least, uh, led to an Oilers power play goal. Because they only got three power play goals, three power plays, and they scored on two of them. I think Costin drew the first one that uh, that, uh, that led to a power play goal, and then yes. Yamamoto got Second the other was two. Second Yamo, yeah. 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 So anyway, he was, uh, uh, he was, I think he drew two. Anyway, he was, uh, he was in there and drawing, uh, uh, drawing penalties and, uh, um, just getting under players' skin and just doing Kyler Yamamoto things. Four shots on net, three hits, you know, and all that. You know, he played uh, 16 minutes because he, you know, he was a top sixer and doing a, a doing his part on a very fine line with uh, Nugent Hopkins and uh, Matthias Janmark. Thought that line had a pretty strong game. Yeah, I did too. You know, um, I think if you just used one uh, word to describe. Yamamoto's performance these last three games that we'd be disruptor. Yeah. He, you know, he just, he, he's quick uh, on the four check and along the walls. He just gets his stick in the way. He, he, he disrupts passes. It's, it's not, he doesn't usually have the capability to knock guys right off pucks, but he can knock them off kilter enough and just get bits and pieces of pucks that, can really cause havoc in the offensive zone. And I don't know about you, but that check that he took into the boards, I took a real deep breath and held it for a while because, as you just mentioned, he just got back from, you know, a neck slash head injury of some kind. I thought, oh, no, the kid has knocked his head against the wall again. But I think Mm -hmm. it turned out to be his, his wrist that I think he hurt a little bit more than his noggin, and he seemed to be okay after the fact. But I'm I'm sure thought, oh, no, no, he, he's just back and just playing so well. So I was glad to see that it wasn't more serious than it was. So, Yeah. Yeah, speaking of which, not 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 really a good thing, but sure could have been a bad thing. The way Leon Drysaddle went down in the first period, 
Yeah. Was t- it looked like the ankle. The way yep. the way he reacted, like his foot just he clashed skates with an opponent crossing the Edmonton blue line on the back check, and his skate kind of went suddenly sideways on him. And if you have had a sore ankle, as I have had in my life, mm-hmm. uh, any kind of surprise movement like that hurts like hell. Yeah, and that's exactly how I responded. And I thought, oh no, because I mean, talk about players Edmonton can't afford to lose. You know, where he's right on, basically second on the list. Anyway, uh, yeah. Uh, but um, then they, Leon was in pain on the bench, and I guess he's been playing through it all year from that high ankle sprain from our friend Mikey Anderson in the playoffs. Mm-hmm. And uh, and you could see him talking to TJ Fors on the bench, and uh, the words, you know, he was sort of nodding his head, and he could say, "We'll see." I'm thinking, okay, I guess we will see. Yeah. And then uh, he went out on the, they got the power play, so of course right out he goes, and he wins a puck battle along the boards and starts the four-way <laughs> sequence that leads to the McDavid goal. And Okay, hopefully. And then after that, he was strong. He actually got more and yeah. more into this game. I thought he played a highly competitive game, but boy, that was a, that was a scary moment. Yeah. Well, I guess we learned through the playoffs last year just how much he's capable of playing through and still mm-hmm. being effective, right? So. Uh-huh. Uh, yeah. You know, this could have been my bad thing tonight. That that phantom hooking call that he got whistled for in the neutral zone. Like, give me a break. <laughs> Talk about a referee getting sucked in on a call. That was awful. Yeah, yeah. Well, the good thing was they killed it off, and that Skinner killed it off. Mm-hmm. Uh, but the, uh, I mean, dry saddle. His stick did get kind of up there, but it didn't really impede Zuccarello at all. And Zuccarello just <laughs> hammered down right hard. Onto it, right? Thing yeah. And Leon is just doing this. And the ref is like, he's not even looking at it. He looks over and he sees Leon doing that. Thought, oh, he must be trying to tell me he didn't do something wrong. He must have done yes. something wrong. And his hand goes yeah. kind of up slowly about eight seconds after the foul. Yeah. The presumptive Leon look, could right? not <laughs> believe it. And he oh. was right to not believe it because that was not a good call. Your favorite official and mine was working the game tonight. Oh, yeah? Oh, okay. I have a few of them. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, uh, so, uh, bad thing, though. Uh, what is that for bad thing? Well, I'm happy to say that, you know, there weren't a lot of bad things in this game. I thought it was a pretty complete game by the guys against a real good hockey team. Mm-hmm. Um um, but I guess <laughs> I'll, I'll pick the low hanging fruit, uh, and I'll pick the giveaway by Darnell nurse on the two, one goal. Oh. Um, and, and bad. yeah. And, you know, <laughs> one of, one of the things that was bad about it was, was the way the TV crew called it because it was like, Oh, what a great takeaway by so-and-so. Excuse me. No, it wasn't. It was a blatant, terrible softy giveaway by Darnell Nurse. Call a spade a spade when a player makes a bad play. That was a bad play. Um, If you want to give the Minnesota Wild guy credit for coming around the net and making a really nice move and and scoring a goal scorer's goal, great. But don't Mm -hmm. make excuses for that soft play behind the net. You know, Mm -hmm. it was 2 nothing at the time, Bruce. The Mm Oilers started really well tonight. They were the easily the best team on the ice for the first 10, 12 minutes of this game. Um, that yeah. giveaway put Minnesota right back into the game mm-hmm. again and gave them a bunch of juice. Yeah. Um, and if Minnesota had come back and won this game tonight, mm-hmm. um, there would have been even more focus on that play. Now look, yeah. Darnell Nurse got a, a belly full of Minnesota's best skaters tonight. He played a bunch, and overall, I thought Darnell played quite well. Um, but on the list of bad things on that night, that giveaway behind the net was number one on my list. Yeah, no, that's to- that's totally fair. I'm I'm going to after the podcast, I, I'm going to grade the the game tonight. Uh, first, I have to tote up the scoring chances. I took all the notes, but I haven't actually got a totals or anything yet. It's a busy night for uh, uh, for yours truly with uh, with uh, our usual uh, uh, host, uh, David Staples, unavailable tonight. Mm-hmm. Thank you, Kurt, for filling in, uh, of course. But uh, uh, if 
I was grading the game after the first period. I mean, Nurse would have gotten a very poor grade indeed because he had mm-hmm. a he had a rough start. Two icings in the first shift for yeah, starters. Yeah, unforced, right? Yeah, 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 yeah. And when the coach is trying to establish his matchups, and uh, he ices the puck seven seconds into the game, and right away the matchup is gone. And anyway, uh, the first period was a slow start for him, but I actually thought he played pretty darn well in the second, and third period, and he's going to actually get a a decent passing grade from me, but it's going to be less decent than it might otherwise have been without that pizza that he passed to uh, Erickson. Yeah. There. It's, it wasn't even, uh, CeCe was all the way in the other corner. He was so far away, he had no chance to recover. No. And no. Erickson Eck literally had, you know, three steamboats to come out in front of the net, stop, yeah. decide which way he's going to deep, put the fake on the goalie and roof it, you know, because there's nobody yeah. close to him. I mean, that was, that was bad. So I'm I'm with you 100%. Uh, 100%. Darnell, uh, natural stat trick, high danger scoring chances has him at 11, 4, and 12 against. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. Well, but I, was... I, I agree over the final, especially over the last 30 minutes, I thought he was quite good. Uh-huh. And that's at five on five, is it, Kurt? Yes. That, wow. So, yeah. Well, they have, yeah. Okay. They have a lot of high danger chances in this game and i i recorded a hell of a lot of them this was a really yeah so uh, sorry really that was scoring game. chances 11 oh, 12 right. and high date that was scoring chances was right. 11 12 high dangers was 5 6 okay all right and uh, by the uh, way oh, philip mm-hmm. broberg uh mm-hmm. tonight mm-hmm. uh high dangers 5 1 nice nice well, a the couple order, the solid order. games in a row for that young fellow at 5 on 5 it was uh, 14 10 Oilers, and overall it was 21 16 Wild. So the Oilers had two high danger chances on the power play and put both of them in the net. And the Wild had, I guess, 11 on the power play and put one of them in the net. So, <laughs> Those are pretty good percentages. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. No, I mean, what a shot that they buried, too. Anyway, it was. Um, uh, it, it, that that was certainly the obvious sort of standout uh, bad thing from from this game. And I'm I'm going to take even though they they succeeded. Uh, I think just the, um, uh, the the penalty kill did get caved a little bit, and um, they allowed in this game. And this, this is mo- almost more a number than I guess than a bad thing, but. I'll put it in this column because I got another set of numbers in mind. 16 shots by Minnesota on the power play in eight minutes. And this is just two games after they allowed 17 shots on three power plays against Washington. Uh, So other teams are figuring out our penalty kill and figuring it out with ease and just pumping shots on net, getting, uh, you know, a, a lot of good quality shots. Of course, five on three, you expect good quality shots. But, I mean, 11 high danger chances in eight minutes of power play is a lot. And that was, Mm -hmm. frankly, where Stuart Skinner did his best work and erased much of the badness of my bad thing. (laughs) Yeah, well, you know what? A lot of people were talking about how solid the Oilers' penalty kill was last year. But I do believe Mike Smith had one of the highest save percentages Mm -hmm of any goaltender in the NHL shorthanded last year. Now, actually, the last three years, Kurt, the whole time he was in Edmonton, he had a save percentage of 9.01 uh, against the uh, other team's power play. And he was a fraction of a... of a. Uh, uh, he was tied but listed ahead of uh, none other than Igor Sturkin, the Vesna wow. Trophy winner, mm. for the number one goalie in the NHL against the power play over the entire three years that he was here. And he never got much credit for it. Mm-hmm. So people were busy enough airing their grievances against Mike Smith, real and imagined, <laughs> at all times that nobody seemed to notice that he was starting good against the penalty kill. And some of it was yeah. Dave Tippett's system that allowed shots from certain places and mm-hmm. closed down other places and cross-cross cross, uh, uh, 
uh, cross seam passes and such and said we expect our goalies to make saves from the top of the faceoff circle and Mike Smith made those saves but this year mm -hmm. those saves haven't always been made in his absence so uh, that's a just a sort of small footnote on Mike Smith's time here mm -hmm. uh, so let's move on then to our numbers before we wrap up and uh, once again I'll let our, our, our special guest uh, sort of pit designated hitter what we've deemed you as Mitford uh, to, uh, yeah. to lead off. What's your choice of uh, number from this game? I'll pick seven, uh, which is seven consecutive games now in which Connor McDavid has scored a goal. Um, oh. And he climbs into very exclusive uh, company when it comes to uh, the players that have done that. Um, there's him, uh, Glenn Anderson, Dave Lumley, Yari Curry, <laughs> Wayne Gretzky, and the last person to do it, who was, any guesses? Uh, I know the answer because they did say it on one, at the oh, end okay. of the broadcast. But <laughs> Jimmy Carson. Jimmy, I don't want to play here, Carson. <laughs> <laughs> this was 88, was it? So I soon after so. he arrived, yeah. like the, I think they specifically said 88 is, you know, he had 49 goals this one full season here, Jimmy Carson. Yeah, and then said, but I don't I'd know. forgotten about the seven game goal scoring streak. That's no mean feat. Yeah, and and Dave uh, has the highest, it's 12. <laughs> yeah, Everybody well would think that Wayne would be number one on that list, right? But he's not. <laughs> Yeah, no. Uh, uh, Lumley was put on uh, on Wayne's line. Uh, this would have been in December of '81, and Lummer just started filling the net and scoring. Uh, you know, mostly one goal a game, but uh, uh, I think it was uh, uh, he, he got he, he kept getting the one goal somehow. Sometimes it would come two minutes into the game. Sometimes it'd be two minutes left in the game, and he had a couple big games in there. And I believe it was after the 12 game streak ended and the bubble had burst. And uh, you think, okay, well, now it's back to uh, going to be back to uh, uh, somewhere else than fantasy land for Dave Lumley. And this would have been, uh, I've got a date for you, Kurt, December 19th of 1981. It was the day we mm -hmm. moved into our house, our first oh, house. Wow. <laughs> and my fellow season ticket holders helped me move in my. In my um, and other friends, and my payment to them was a the ticket to the hockey game, which started at six o'clock. So we had an early <laughs> deadline to get the move done. And we got to the game, and the Oilers beat the North Stars nine to six. And Lumley had a hat trick and three assists in, <laughs> in the game. This is coming off of the end of his uh, end of his streak. And of course, that made him the second star in that game because Wayne Gretzky also had a hat trick and four assists. So <laughs> <laughs> it was a, a very memorable game, and it was the beginning of the spectacular five game homestand that ended with Wayne's 50th goal in 39 wow. games. So I remember that uh, that whole homestand in very um, rich detail. And, Those are. Those are awesome stories. My <laughs> Lumley Gretzky story is much more recent than yours. Okay. It, it was it was at the old barn, and it was the celebration of the greatest NHL team ever. And my my son and I went, and All our right. seats were were right right on the bumpers, right on the boards, mm -hmm. uh, at uh, uh, about halfway down uh, between the blue line, and the goal line, so right about the faceoff circle. And mm -hmm. so after the ceremony was done, Wayne came off the stage with the cup. And walk the cup around the, the boards. So mm -hmm. he literally nice. walked walked right up to my son, so my son could actually touch the Stanley Cup. Nice. Right. And 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 right behind him came came Dave Lumley. <laughs> and Dave stopped and chatted with my son and, and signed his signed his Oilers hat and, and, and said, uh, now both you and I know what how what it feels like to touch the Stanley Cup. And he kept walking. <laughs> and my son still talks about that moment. Yeah, yeah, Lumber has been a, uh, uh, they call him Lumber, and uh, my friends and I sometimes called him Lumber for his <laughs> lay, laying on thereof at times during his career. And he was, uh, uh, he, he's a very charismatic individual uh, on the ice and uh, and in the community. So, yeah, anyway, that 12-game streak, he missed by one the all-time NHL record. 
Like it, it was really a big story for <laughs> for a while, and uh, he just came up. He just came up one short, and then he responded with a hat trick right after. So, anyway, he uh, 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 he's the all-time order record holder for sure. The other guys did they just get to seven? Who had the longest streak of uh, of the other guys that you named? Curry, Anderson, uh, ninety nine. Uh, you know what? I don't have the numbers because Dave oh, okay. was the longest at twelve, um, and I know Carson. I think Carson's at eight. Okay. Oh, well, yeah. okay. All right. Yeah. So I wonder if Connor will tie Dave. Yeah. Well. Five more days. Well, maybe he'll go for that league record. I don't think that's changed. So. I wouldn't put it past him. Anyway, all this talk at the beginning of the season was: Can he get to fifty, or can he uh, can he get to fifty? And, he can get to 50 if he wants to. Everybody wants to get to 50 at least once. I think he has his, he doesn't have a number in mind, but I, I would say this, it's bigger than 50. Mm. He he might, he <laughs> has an outside shot at hitting 50 and 50. Well, it's, yeah, I mean, it's still there, right? What, what was it tonight, 25 and 28? Yeah. So anyway, yeah, he's, uh, last year there was a, the MVP was awarded to the guy who got 60. I'll just leave it there. So. <laughs> I, I so, like the cut of your jib. <laughs> uh -huh. Okay, well, my number also has to do with Connor McDavid, uh, who tonight led the Oilers in another sort of ho-hum game, one goal, one assist, two points. Led the team, led the uh, forwards in ice time, 23.01, in shifts, 27. In power play time, 2 minutes, 52 seconds, tied with dry saddle, which is a very common occurrence. Uh, he led the Oilers in shorthanded time, three minutes, 11 seconds. He was three ticks short of leaving and also in even strength time, so not quite a clean sweep in the ice time uh, categories. Uh, his four shots were one shy of uh, leader Zach Hyman among forwards, but he led the forwards in hits, three, giveaways, two, takeaways, two, block shots, three, face-offs taken, 23 hmm. all of those categories like Connor mcdavid was all over this game and putting up crooked numbers right around the event summary the only thing he doesn't have is anything for missed shots or shots that were blocked all the shots he attempted were on goal and otherwise he's everywhere to be seen in uh in all of the columns so unreal hey yeah and you know what? He wasn't even named one of the game's three stars because you know what? We've come to sort of become used to this sort of thing. But even for Connor, I mean, leading in leading in penalty kill minutes and block shots, you know, that's uh, uh, he uh, uh, he laid it out there in this game. And uh, this was a game where the Oilers needed to respond, and uh, and their captain was among the many Oilers. I would say, frankly, all of the Oilers who who did. Uh, especially in the second half of this game, that uh, once Minnesota pushed back, they they sort of established that you want to win this game, you're going to have to raise your game, and the others did exactly that. Took it, yep. took it to them, and took it from them. Um, incidentally, um, this didn't happen on the ice, um, but 6:30, Chad had a special guest in the second period tonight. Uh, mm -hmm. Evander Kane uh, oh, yeah. joined the guys and did did uh, color for a period. <laughs> and while I think all Oilers fans hope he'll remain an Oiler for a number of years yet, I'd suggest to you if he ever wants it, he's got a future as a broadcaster. He was pretty good. <laughs> I've seen him interviewed. He's very comfortable in front of a camera and, and microphone. Yes, very and well that's spoken. A fact. That's yeah. a fact, and, he, and he's very photogenic, which never hurts uh, for people who want to become, uh, you know, TV broadcasters. Uh, and he's got his opinions, and he, you know, he's got his checkered past. He's got <laughs> a lot of uh, a lot of um, uh, a lot of different columns that he's got his own crooked numbers in. Let's put it that yeah. way. In, so, in my business, they call it compelling. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah. 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 yeah, and you know the business, so I'll take your word for that, Kurt. <laughs> so, anyway, my business is to get now down to uh, summarizing scoring chances and then writing game grades, and it's already 11.30 our time, so it's going to be another late night for Bruce, but that's all right. I'm always happy to stay up late to write about a win, <laughs> especially over the wild. Yeah. So, uh, it's been very fun talking with you, and uh, 
to uh, sort of recap a successful night for for the team. And uh, uh, so I'll ask if you have any last thoughts on the on the game or the position the team is in at this moment. Uh, well, they're in a playoff position right now. They're they're third in the division. Um, and you know, a while ago it looked like uh, Seattle was. Uh, going to be tough to catch, but now we're, I believe, we're a point behind them. We've effectively reeled them in. So um, as as uneven as this season has been, mm-hmm. they're in a good position right now if they can keep their game going in the right direction. Yeah, well, Washington sacked uh, Seattle tonight, eh? Yeah. And, yeah, Washington, I think they've won, won two more games since they beat Edmonton. Uh, in such a, a strong game on Monday. And I don't think, I think if people were too busy crapping on the Oilers to give full credit to how well Washington played. They're in a desperate situation of their own that needed turning around, and clearly they've set their minds to it. And, uh, yep. and uh, have have taken to that task. And, and uh, Ovi started scoring empty net goals again, at least. And, and uh, uh, they're, uh, Seattle's in, now in for they had a bit of a of a friendly schedule and now they have an unfriendly one for a while and the Oilers are largely through i'd say the worst stretch of schedule that they're going to face yep so now's club. the time for for Edmonton to make up ground on so one point yeah one point i think yeah wow. yeah nice. and and one of the teams behind us the flames markstrom lost again tonight columbus beat them so mm-hmm. Yeah, three to one. So it's more than Markstrom that didn't get the job done there. Yeah. So anyway, well, that's good. I mean, nights like Monday where they lost to the Caps, and I think it was uh, uh, Calgary won late, and Vancouver won in overtime, and LA mm-hmm. won in a shootout, and uh, or no, Vegas won in shootout. Anyway, all of the teams always were tr- all eked out wins, and it was sort of the worst possible set of outcomes. So we. <laughs> You need to turn that around, and with two two good wins since, the Oilers have done just that, and they're back in a solid, not exactly commanding, but uh, their game's starting to come around, I think, is the, is the bigger thing. Yeah, well and, and these guys that are getting their getting their reps, you know, the Broberries and the, and the Hamblins of the of the team, uh, the Costins, mm-hmm. uh, that are, uh, um, you know, just – Getting the, every night, look in the lineup and getting their 8, 10, 15, whatever minutes might not necessarily be a huge amount, but repetitively. It's not like they get yeah. one game and then they're in the press box for three. Yeah, well, cost so, an, an assist and drew a penalty again tonight. Right? Mm-hmm. So, so, so these guys are all making their case. And when the, when the lineup does start to fill back in, as it's starting to, you know, with Yamamoto back, that's a big out. Mm-hmm. Uh, they can start to squeeze out at the bottom end of the roster. Uh, the lesser deserving players and one or two of the vets might lose a job to one or two of these young guys. And Hey, that's yep. good. If it improves yep. the team. So well, I hear Warren Fogel is going to be back on the road trip. So. Mm-hmm. Right on. Well, I bet it's not James Hamlin who comes out. I bet it's not Clem Costin either. Yeah. So the real Clem shady, they're calling them. <laughs> <laughs> he's caught fire boy. Uh, I, th- I think he's the kind of player oil country will, will glom on. Oh uh-huh. Yeah. If you score a Gordie Howe hat trick and follow it up with an interview like that, you're going to win a lot of fans. There's no two ways so. about it. Yeah, so, for sure. Anyway, Kurt, let's uh, let's uh, call it a night right there, and uh, you can carry on with what you're doing next. And I'm going to be up to my eyeballs in this hockey game for a while yet. But uh, <laughs> once again, thank you very much for uh, filling in. It's a pleasure talking with you as always. Hey, it's always great to chat with YouTubers. Take care. All right. Right. Well, thanks for listening, everyone. And in the meantime, and in between times, this has been another edition of the Cult of Hockey podcast.